Hello, and this is chapter 7, part 2, translocation. It's the last part of chapter 7, so yay! Bye-bye, plants. Okay, anyways, um, let's cut straight to the chase. Now, in transport in plants, there are a few things that we need to be transported. So far, we have covered gases. So gases are transported via simple diffusion. Uh, there is water and ions which are transported via, um, well, you will see in part 1b and part 1c, mainly water and xylem is transported against grade, the, the gravity by transpiration pool and by adhesion and cohesion of water. Okay, but now here we are talking about the translocation of sucrose. Now in general, sucrose is made at the mesophyll cells at the source um, along with other things, but we only talk about sucrose in A levels here. And there will be loading of sucrose into the sieve tube from the companion cells. Okay, and then the sucrose gets transported from the source to the sink via the sieve tube using this process called translocation. And then there is the unloading of sucrose. Three steps here for the transport of sucrose. Now, why is translocation in the first place though? Translocation is the transport of assimilates within plants. What is assimilates exactly? They are soluble organic substances uh, which are produced by the plant via photosynthesis. So for example, there's sucrose, there's glucose, there's fructose, there's amino acids, there's many, many more things. Um, mainly, we will talk about sucrose here. It's transported at phloem set in the phloem tissue, right? It assimilates are transported via phloem set in phloem tissue. And just a reminder, phloem has the companion cell and the sieve tube, and they are side by side like this. And the companion cell, um, as you have learned through the MCQ you got wrong uh, in the quiz, companion cell actually plays a role in the transport of sucrose from source to sink. First of all, let's talk about what is exactly source and sink. Now, source, this is the definition, the site of synthesis of photosynthetic products. Source is where photosynthesis happens and where these products are produced. And after it's produced, products like sucrose will be loaded okay, or transported into the sieve tube here uh, at the source. Now, an example of this is mesophyll cells of leaf, which obviously conduct photosynthesis. Uh, it could be palisade, it could be mes mesophyll, uh, it could be spongy mesophyll cells. Now, let's look at the sink. The sink is the site where acinates are stored or used for growth. This is where the sucrose is unloaded from the sieve tubes and then stored or used there. Now, examples of this could be roots, or tubers, tubers are like potatoes and whatnot, right? Um, fruits, etc. And wherever that needs those assimilates and stores those assimilates. Now, this could be above or below the source, okay? It could be above or below the source. This means that phloem sap can flow upwards or downwards in a sieve tube. Of course, one way in one sieve tube at any time. So if there is up and down, you will need two sieve tubes, right? One sieve tube will go up and the other one can come down. So it's not like water. Transport of water requires, um, is always upwards, right? It's in xylem vessels, water is always moving upwards against gravity. But however, with assimilates, um, because of the location of the sink, this phloem sap can flow upwards or downwards. Okay, so as usual, let's go step by step and start with mesophyll cells. And how does it get to the sink? Mesophyll cells here are the source. In well, if you're a mesophyll cell, you may not be necessarily close to the sieve tube. So you need to be transporting those substances nearer to the mesophyll cells near the sieve tube. You know what I mean? So, for example, here you have a lot of palisade mesophyll cells, here you have a lot of spongy, right? What if you are this cell right here at the end that is not as close to the sieve tubes as you'd like? So, if you're sucrose, you will need to be transporting, right, 
through the flow, uh, through cells near to the flow via the simplex pathway or the amplex pathway. Now, it's important to note that photosynthesis produces glucose. Okay, that's the first product, and it is converted into sucrose into mesophyll cells. And both sucrose and glucose are actually soluble in water, and therefore they use the same pathways that water use in cells. Okay, now we get to the harder part, right? After the sucrose moves nearer to the sieve tubes, it has to be loaded into the sieve tubes. Loading of sucrose into sieve tubes is a fairly um, okay process, but it requires you to think, uh, like, listen carefully, pay attention, and make sure you understand and imagine this correctly. So let's go. Now, loading of sucrose into seed tube requires active transport. It is not a straightforward active transport though. It requires two proteins here, a proton pump and a sucrose H plus co-transporter. It requires hydrogen ions, okay, other than ATP. Right, let's do step by step and we'll see if you get this, right? So, you need the hydrogen ions to be pumped out through the proton pump this requires ATP, it is an active transport mechanism. And where is it pumping to? Right, this cell here is actually the companion cell, right? Remember companion cells are, are have nucleus, they have mitochondria, they have R ER, and they have all those stuff that the foam sieve tube doesn't have. So anyways, these, the proton pump is placed here in the membrane and it's pumping these hydrogen ions into this blue region here. This blue region here is a mesophyll cell wall. Okay, so this is not the sieve tube yet. We're not even talking about sieve tube yet. We are just talking about between the mesophyll cell and the companion cell here. So it's active transport. So it's, um, this hydrogen ion is actually moving against its concentration gradient. So you can see here there's more H plus, and here on this side there's only one H plus because here very low hydrogen ion concentration, here it's higher. Now this difference in uh, concentration ions is obviously called a gradient, okay, a concentration gradient, and as it continues to pump hydrogen ions across into the mesophyll cell wall. This is going to cause a steep hydrogen ion gradient. Or you can just say hydrogen ion gradient builds up. Okay, as it becomes steeper. Okay, this is like the magical part. What does the second one does? The second one is a co-transporter. So what it means is that hydrogen and sucrose will move down together into the companion cell. So Hydrogen ions, when they re return through the co-transporter into the companion cell, it is down the concentration gradient. Remember here, there's a high concentration of ions. Here is a very low concentration of ions. So it is down the concentration gradient using the sucrose H plus co-transporter protein. Sucrose is transported at the same time. But sucrose is actually co-transported together against the concentration gradient. Okay, there's actually more sucrose in the companion cell than in the cell wall of the mesophyll cell. Okay, because the transport's very quick, and that's why there's more accumulation in the companion cell. Okay, that's about it. So let me repeat that again: hydrogen ions. We enter companion cell down the concentration gradient, and sucrose is actually transported into the companion cell against its concentration gradient. So when we when we talk about the mechanism of transport, what exactly is it? So if it's hydrogen ions and it's against, sorry, it's down its concentration gradient through a membrane protein, this is facilitated diffusion. Hydrogen ions is transported via facilitated diffusion. However, sucrose is transported via secondary active transport. It is against its concentration gradient. It doesn't require ATP at this particular protein, but 
hydrogen ions actually, uh, when it moves down its concentration gradient, it actually acts as an energy source for the transport of sucrose. So this is, that's why it's called secondary active transport. It doesn't directly require ATP, but ATP is actually used earlier here to, trans, to build this um, hydrogen ion gradient. This is also called a proton gradient. Okay. So with that, sucrose is now inside the companion cell. It has moved from the mesophyll cell to the companion cell. What is left is to move from the companion cell into the sieve tube. And fortunately for us, this is just by simple diffusion through the plasmodesmata from the companion cell into the sieve tube element. So, so far we have loaded the sucrose into the sieve tubes, but still in the sieve tubes near the source, we need to be able to transport sucrose from the sieve tubes near the source to the sieve tubes nearer to the sink. So what happens is this, it requires water. Yep, you heard me right, it requires some water. Now the xylem and flow are connected in some way. And when you think about it just now, when we move the sucrose into the sieve tube, this actually lowers the water potential in the sieve tube element near the source. What would happen is the xylem vessels that are connected to it um, would, would have a higher water potential and water is able to enter the sieve tubes via osmosis, via those plasmodesmata, down the water potential gradient from the xylem vessels into the sieve tubes via osmosis. Now, this actually increases what we call the hydrostatic pressure in sieve tube near the source. Think of this like a push. You know, water goes in, it's like a flush. Uh, but we don't say that. We say it increases hydrostatic pressure near the source. Now, if you need an illustration, let's look at this picture. You can see um, there's lots of solutes here and water comes in. And what happens is the solutes would move downwards. In this case, the solute is the sucrose. Okay, again, high concentration, therefore low water potential. Water moves in. There you go, very nice effect there. Um, and sucrose with the water is transported down, to, down the sieve tube. Okay, but what is going on near the sink? Doesn't the, near, doesn't the sieve tube near the sink have a very high concentration as well? Now, the answer is no. Near the sink, there is a lower hydrostatic pressure, okay? And this is due to the removal of sucrose. Well, there's unloading of sucrose from the sieve tube into the sink. That's why near the sink is always going to be a lower hydrostatic pressure. And therefore, when the foam step is moving, it's always moving from a region of high to low hydrostatic pressure. I guess you can say it is down the hydrostatic pressure gradient towards the sink, not upwards or downwards. I'm sorry, it's towards the sink. Now, we call this push, this flush, okay? These movements of fluids down a hydrostatic pressure gradient, we call it mass flow. Okay, it's just what the phenomenon is called. And mass flow is what causes the transport of sucrose from the sieve tubes near the source to be transferred to sieve tubes in the sink. Now, um, this is an, just another illustration and you'll see this in your notes. You can see here, it's nicely illustrated that, hey, there's a high concentration of sucrose here near the source, water moves in and that sucrose is transported downwards here. And you can see the sucrose is then unloaded into the sink. We'll explore that later. But you also see this extra arrow here, which is very useful. It tells us that water actually moves back into the xylem. Now that is true because what happens is water in the sieve tubes near the sink do have a higher hydrostatic pressure than the xylem vessels. Why? Because of that mass flow, that push, yeah? And what results in is that water moves back to the xylem vessels 
down the hydrostatic pressure gradient. This is just illustration here. Right here, we will have a higher hydrostatic pressure due to the mass flow. And here, it's moving continuously moving upwards. So water is going to move this way, back into inside them, and then upwards again. So that's pretty cool. So that's translocation in sieves tubes. Now we have sucrose going from the source in component cell, in the phloem, sieve tubes, and sieve tubes near the source. Back, uh, sucrose has moved from sieve tubes near the source to sieve tubes near the sink. So now, how do we unload sucrose from sieve tubes to the sink? Now it's pretty easy, really. So sink has a lower concentration of sucrose than sieve tube and sucrose just moves down its concentration gradient by diffusion. All is great and all is fine. Yay, passive. This is a passive process. What happens at the sink actually and why is it that we say that it has a low concentration of sucrose? You can see there's quite a lot here. But the thing is, it's not remaining as sucrose. So quite a low concentration in the sink. Why? Sucrose is converted into other things like glucose, fructose, starch, into more uh, compact and insoluble starch molecules like amylose and amylopectin in the form of starch, right? And these processes are all catalyzed by enzymes. Uh, other than that, sucrose or glucose could be used for respiration, growth, or storage, right? So it could be um, used immediately, metabolized into maybe other ATP and stuff like that. And with that, we have transported sucrose from the source to the sink, and we are done. I hope you don't have any questions. Um, and if you do, you can feel free to message me anytime you want. I will not reply at midnight. I know you tend to like to do that. So um, that's it, and good luck for your test coming up this Thursday. See you. Bye. Oh, yeah, I forgot to say something. Well, just a little bit of notice. Well, you know how like loading of sucrose in sieve tubes is an active process? So when we look at the overall translocation of sucrose, the overall process of transport of sucrose, we also deem it as an active process. Because, you know, if one part requires energy, the whole thing in general would require energy as well to function. Because if one part doesn't function, the whole thing doesn't function. So if the question ever asked, is translocation an active process? The answer is yes. Ding. Okay, anyways, that's all. Bye.